Matthew chapter 25 this morning, and I chose this parable, the parable of the talents, because so often we as Western Christians miss opportunities to impact the kingdom of God. So often we'll miss these opportunities, and the opportunities I'm talking about pertain to our activities that we have in life, things we're involved in, gatherings we have with family, with friends, going to sporting events, being involved in sporting events, Um, friendships, you name it, there's all these opportunities we have to make an impact for the kingdom of God, and I think sometimes, I'm guilty of this too, where we silo out our faith with everything else that goes on in our life. It's like, okay, I, I've got my faith over here compartmentalized in church and my devotional time. If I do Wednesday nights or I'm a part of other parts in the life of our church, that's over here in this night, nice, neat box. Meanwhile, we have all these activities we're involved in. And we're like, whether we say it or not, it's like, well, that's got to kind of stay over there, real nice and neat and pretty. And, and meanwhile, I do all this stuff, and I never really make kingdom impact in those areas. And I've lived this way, I've seen it lived out this way, and it's one thing you may have your toes stepped on a little bit by the scriptures this morning about, is how Christ calls us to take our Christian life into all of our life. Every single aspect and part of our life, Christ is calling you to say, invite me in. Invite me in. Worship me, not just in song, but in life, in every aspect. So again, we're in Matthew chapter 25, we're in verses 14 through 30, and we're discussing the parable of the talents in a message that I've entitled, Called to Care, Called to Care. Matthew chapter 25. I like the jingle. Here we go. It says this. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted them to his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then then he went away. And he who had received the five talents went at once and he traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and he dug it in the ground and he hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five more talents saying, Master, you deliver to me five talents here. I've made five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have, the, you have uh, been faithful over little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you'd be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what's yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For everyone who has, more will be given. And he who has an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast this worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the scriptures. God, as I often pray, help them to be a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Help illuminate your word to the people of God so that we would be a light, a city on a hill, a light to the world, so that others might see the light 
in the midst of their darkness and come near. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I want us to see this morning from our text is this, is that we are called to care for what has been given to us. We are called to care for what's been given, or rather, what's been entrusted to us. So it's this idea of stewardship. That's what we're talking about today, is stewardship. How well are you using what God has given you? Because all good things come from God above, and he's given them to us. And we see this in verses 14 through 18. Now, in our parable, we see a story. And in this parable, there is a man who's on a journey, and this man represents God. This master has given his servants some of what is his and entrusted it to them to see how well and how faithful they are with what he's given them. And his servants represent people he's placed on earth, as in us. We are his servants. Whether we are believers or unbelievers, we are all called to serve, to take care of what's his. In fact, the scriptures say this, Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 26 says, For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And this is Paul quoting David back in Psalm 24, 1, saying, It's all God's. This world is the Lord's. He owns it. He made it. He's the creator of it. And those that live on the earth, we are his servants to take care of what he's given us. In fact, this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where we see the creation mandate. Creation mandate. So this is God telling Adam in all his lineage, you're to take care of what I've given you. Go there. Genesis 1, 26. It says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So again, all the earth is the Lord's. He's created it, and he's called us to care for it. We're called to care for what's his, and we are his servants. This is why many people all throughout the world desire to take care of the world. God put that in their heart from the very beginning. The reason that people um, formed Arbor Day Foundations and, and cleaning programs throughout the city to beautify the city is because God put the create, creation mandate in their heart. They can't help it. They want to take care of the world, and they may not even know why that's there. The scriptures say why it's there. It's because God hardwired it into us. And while I was studying this text, thinking about the creation mandate, a theme song from a childhood cartoon came to my mind, Captain Planet. I don't know if any of y'all parents in the room ever walked by the TV and heard this song, but it's like, Captain Planet, he's the hero, gonna take pollution down to, some of y'all, all All right, some of y'all, down to zero, and then it gets to this one part in the song where it says, looting and polluting is not the way, here's what some, oh, okay, nobody, Captain Planet has to say, (laughs) maybe it's just me, (laughs) I don't know, (laughs) I thought this would go a little better, um, but Captain Planet, right? So we see that in the 90s even, there is this big push on caring for trees and clean air. And that is a great goal. But the end goal is not to simply just care for more trees and get more clean air. It's bigger than that. That God gave us the stuff we have on the earth to care for, for the end goal of making his name glorious, of praising him with how we take care of our yard, how we take care of our community. And in the midst of doing that, we honor God, saying, hey, look, the reason I do this is because I want to take care of what's his, because this stuff is going to stay here. Meanwhile, I'm going to live forever somewhere else in the presence of my maker. Now go back to verse 15. Verse 15 says this. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. To each one according to his ability. And then he went away. So the property owner entrusted his money to three servants. He gave one five, 
one, two, and one individual. He gave one talent. Each of them received based on how well they cared for the creation. Now, what's really cool is as I was studying this, I had never heard this before, but each talent is worth 16 and a half years' wages. Now, think about the one who had the five talents. That guy set for life, and yet he doubles it anyway. It would have been easy for him to sit back and just count his money, but instead he said, no, look, I'm doing I'm, I'm serving my maker, not simply because I'm set, but because I want to do more with what I've been given. It's this different kind of mindset. And here's how they respond, the, the one with five and the one with two and the one with one. Verse 16, it says, he who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug it in the ground, and he hid his master's money. So the first two, what did they do? They doubled what they had. They doubled what they had. And this for us today could mean how you treat your finances, yes, but also other parts of your life. How you treat your job. How you treat students' school, the classwork you've been given. Um, it also uh, has to do with anything else you've been blessed by. Use that to make much of God and to help other people. Meanwhile, the third servant has a different value system. What does he do? Well, he buries what he has. He hides it. In fact, another way to say it is he hoards it for himself, only to be used by himself. He lives life without any risks. And as a result, he blesses no one. He blesses no one. He helps no one out. Now, does this sound familiar? Does this sound familiar? How often do we as Westerners and even Christians, how often do we want to live a safe life rather than an obedient life that may cost us something, may require us to use what we have to help somebody else out? That when we give, we may not receive anything in this world in return. This is what Christ calls us to, is to live a life of giving, not in fear. Now, there's a pastor by the name of John Piper, and he said something a number of years back at what's called Passion Conference. It's a conference for college-age students. He said this statement back in 1998. He used this example of a retired couple spending the remainder of their life vacationing with one goal in mind, to collect shells, to collect shells. And what Piper goes on to say is to not buy into the American dream, meaning simply don't just live life uh, to get a nice house, just to get a nice car, just to have a nice family. Don't let your life be lived only for and to that extent. There's more to life than that. There's so much more. Those are not bad things, but is that your ultimate thing? Is that what you're living for? Is to have nice stuff? That's the American dream. And some of us have fallen victim to that. We fall into that mindset. Is he trying to say, well, it's a bad thing to have fun? No. No. His purpose is to point out that the end goal of what he's given us is to take care of it for his glory, his glory. And that's a kind of living that will take risks. That is a kind of living that will be sacrificial. And here's a question we must ask ourselves today. Are you living a safe life? Or are you living a life set on caring for what's God? Caring for what's God's, even if it requires some sacrifice on your behalf. Now I want to point out something. Um, because this is easy for us to do as well. Is God saying you should never own a nice car that's dependable? No. No. But be careful that you're not hoarding it for yourself. Be careful that you're not losing your mind if it gets a scratch or a ding or a stain. That shows the heart. 
It shows the heart. Now, I mean, I, I don't want scratches and dings all up alongside our truck. It's not what I want. But I don't want to lose my mind over the fact that this temporary thing, as nice as it is, takes control of my emotions. And I lose it for the rest of the day. And I treat everybody around me like trash. Because I'm upset over a small thing that will pass that I have to get a new one of in 10 years. We have to focus on the heart of God. What does God want us to see? It's that everything is all His. It's all His. Your car, your house, your finances, your family is His. And He's called us to care for what He has given us. The second thing I want us to see this morning is this. From verses 19 through 23, is that we're called to care about multiplication. We're called to care about multiplication. Look back at verse 19. It says this. It says, Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents. Saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. Well, I made five more talents. And his master said to him, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also went to the one who had two talents. And he came forward saying, Master, you've delivered to me two talents. Here, I've made two more talents um, that, that are here. Verse 23, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your of your master. Now we see here that some time had passed in verse 19. The master had left, he had returned, and he's assessing the work that's done by the servants he entrusted his money to. And the five, the one with the five, doubled. The one with the two, doubled the money they had been given. And in the same way, anything you have been given by God is for you to increase in some way been used to increase in some way. Now what that means is for you to take what you've been given and use it so that its effectiveness and its efficiency might be multiplied. Might be multiplied. In fact, you'll find out all throughout Scripture, this is God's heart, that he might multiply a blessing. That he might use what you have and multiply it. But notice here, who's the one doing the multiplication? It's the Lord, not us. Not us by our efforts. Yes, we work hard for the Lord, not for man. Yes, but it's up to God. We give it to him and say, God, use this, bless this, honor that. Giving, time, friendships, whatever it is, God, I want you to multiply this opportunity. Back in Genesis, God calls Adam and Eve to be fruitful and to multiply. Then in Exodus chapter 1, verse 7, we read the Jewish people had multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so much so that Pharaoh feared them and wanted to imprison them. And in the Gospels, Jesus takes five loaves, two fish, and he multiplies it and feeds everyone until they're stuffed. And if that wasn't enough, he takes the seven loaves from the disciples and some fish and multiplies that and feeds 4,000. God is all about multiplication. And in our eyes, that doesn't make any sense. Like, don't you want to be there back when he multiplied the loaves and fish and just see how he did it? I would love to see that. Like, how did you take what many pastors refer to as a lunchable and multiply that and feed grown men and women and families till they were stuffed? How did you do that, God? But that's what he's all about. And I love to throw this statement out there. If God spoke, which he did, everything into existence from nothing, why would he not be able to use what he made and do anything with it, right? If he spoke ex nihilo, out of nothing, everything, why could he not take what's here and do miracles with it? Why could he not? So how does he do this? Well, it's hard for us to understand that because we don't think in terms of multiplication, we think in terms of addition. That's human effort. That's trying our hardest, filling our schedule to the brim, exhausting ourselves even. And that's not the way of God. 
Yes, you're going to have some tiring days. Yes, you're going to have some difficult moments because we live in a broken world. But we need to take a heart assessment of ourselves and see if all the work, all the expenditure, all the focus that we have is on him doing something that we only are limited by. We have limitations. And God can multiply things that we couldn't. Now notice, the servant doesn't just add up. I think this is, I'm just, I want to point this out because I think it's cool. He doesn't just add up one or two more talents, the one with five. He multiplies it, doubles it, because his heart is focused on his master. And the same is true with the one with two. He doubles what he has because he loves his master. Now notice, the master says to the servants, those who doubled their talents, in verses 21 and 23, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now notice, what did he call the servants? Faithful, faithful, faithful servants. Are they faithful? Yes. One of my favorite preachers and pastors uh, left the world this year, uh, Dr. Tim Keller, on May 17th. And one of the greatest things about him was the fact that he taught the scriptures simply, but with depth. Showing that a dying world in New York City, even cold-hearted atheists and agnostics from the East Coast could come to faith in Jesus. And it, he awakened so many through his ministry. And throughout his years of faithfulness, his in ministry impact and his influence was multiplied, not just in New York City and not just in his church, but also to ministries like the Gospel Coalition, also other ministries um, that went out and started conferences and started training pastors and helping them get connected and doing church planning in the inner city. And he never tried to wow the crowds with bright lights or the, the catchiest new song or really <clears throat> slick sermon titles. No, he, he was just about clearly preaching the word of God and giving the scriptures voice louder than any man could speak. That's what he did. He gave voice to the word of God to speak louder than what he could do on his own. And this is the approach we must have in a world that's inundated with all these conflicting ideas. We have so much information out there. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what's true from what's not true. I mean, just reading up about the news about Israel and the terrorists at war, sometimes you hear one report and then you hear another report and then you hear complaints this way and that way. And you're just like, ah, how do I know what's true? And the word of God brings truth to bear to give us wisdom and insight and discernment that we wouldn't have on our own. God gives us clarity. And he gives us clarity in other aspects. When it comes to your finances, he gives you clarity. When it comes to your skills, gifts, and abilities, he gives you clarity. College-age students, I have a heart for you guys. You're in a hard season of life. Trying to figure out what you're going to do for the next 50 to 70 years of your life is daunting, given the fact that most of your time you're in a classroom. And yet God can give clarity. Clarity. He can give insight. He can give wisdom. He can bring wise counsel to come around you, to speak into your life, to help you with all things. And for those that live a life like this, that are focused on him, here's what he says. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And I love that statement there. The word joy means celebration. Enter into the celebration forevermore, forevermore. Have you ever been to a gathering with friends and never wanted to leave that gathering? That's heaven. Forevermore. No more sin, no more shame, no more suffering, no more pain, no more worries. None of that. All the former things have passed away and behold, the new has come. That's the hope. That's the promise before you. Set your eyes on that. But it's only God who brings that and it's only God who who helps you in this life to multiply what he's given you. Again, we're called to multiply by caring for what is God's. Third and final thing I want you to see this morning is this. We're called to care about the relationship we have to the master. 
We're called to care about that relationship we have to the master. Go back with me in verse 24. It says here, He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you'd be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what's yours. But his master said to him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I do not, where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. At my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now notice something about this third servant. What does he do? What does he say to his master? How does he live his life? Well, first, he accuses his master. Second, he, he lives his life driven by fear. Third, he justifies himself. He says, I did what was right. And fourth, he just overall shows that he does not love his master by what he's saying. So how does he accuse? Look at verse 24. He says, Master, I knew you'd be a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. He's telling his master, look, you have great authority and power. I don't. How could I do anything that would please you? He's accusing his master of being unfair. He's like, look, you could do far more. And still, all the while, he never takes ownership of his own failings. He points the finger elsewhere and never says, hey, I'm owning up to this. I've I've got some problems. I've got some things I've done wrong. No, no. He says, you're the one at fault. I did what I thought was right. I'm, I'm justified in my own eyes. Second is he was driven by fear. How is he driven by fear? Look back at verse 25. He says, I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Fear is the arch nemesis to trust. Fear is the arch nemesis to trust. It is always at war, never helping, never benefiting the one who should have trust in the master. It always produces seeds of doubt. And if those seeds take root, they in our lives will grow and fester and continue to remain unless we put voice to the fear and ask for the Lord to root out fears we've been holding on to. This is the one talent man's mentality. He is so driven by fear. And clearly, there's a better way to use what he's been given. Otherwise, he wouldn't try to justify himself. He knew he was wrong. He had an answer, and he was ready to give that answer. He knew this was wrong. This is why he responded in the way he did. And he hid what he should have doubled. Now, how does he justify himself? Well, he calls his master a hard man or a harsh man in verse 24. There's no way, he says, that he could please his master by his efforts. So here's his mentality. Well, if I can't please him, why even try? Why even commit to anything? If I can't please him, you know what, I'm just going to bury it and wait. At least I'll have one better than having nothing. This is his mentality instead of seeing his master the right way. And fourth, he just overall shows that he does not love his master. In fact, he hates his master. We already know he accused him. We already know that he lives based on fear rather than trusting him. And we know that he justified himself. And because of his false beliefs, he shows that he hates this man. Think about it. In our world, are there ways in which we have accused God of doing wrong? Have we justified ourselves and not seen him as who he really is? Have we as well um, lived based on fear? Now, don't hear me wrong. I know at times there are things that happen and we feel like they're unjust. I get that. I know there's times where uh, we feel right in what we're doing and later God convicts us in the moment. In fact, the, the Old Testament law speaks to that. When God helps you to make your sin known. 
I get that. In addition to that, it is very easy to just live on fear and the like in the days we're living in. But here's the heart of the text. You are not meant to be driven and guided and focused on those all your day. If you're in that place, not only are you unhealthy emotionally, mentally, spiritually, but also part of you is walking in disobedience to the master. If you're constantly in fear, constantly accusing, constantly justifying yourself before God, you are in opposition against the master. And he says this in love. He says, hey, I want you to come back to me. I don't want you to, to, to say all these things and distance yourself from me. See, the, the truth about Christianity is the fact that Christianity points to truth, but it doesn't remain hope, hopeless. In fact, Christianity points to truth, and it points to hope. There's always hope. There's always hope. We're not happy and joyful simply because we should have a positive attitude, but because of the truth and because of the hope that is with us and that's ever before us. Scripture is saying we should redirect ourselves back to him. Unlike this third servant. If we have love for God, that changes everything. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Hear that again. If we love God, we ought to keep the commandments, and as a result of keeping the commandments, they're not a burden. So I'm just going to throw this out there. If the law of God is a burden all the time, it's possible that you haven't given your life to Jesus. It's possible. The scriptures say here clearly, if we love him, who want to keep his commandments and they're not a burden. So when someone comes up to us and says, hey, I miss seeing you at church, you don't feel rubbed the wrong way. You feel loved. And when someone comes to us and says, hey man, I know you're going through a hard time. Can I pray for you? We're not offended by that. We're encouraged by that. And when someone maybe in a Bible study says, hey, Man, it's great to have a reading plan. It's great to have uh, books that you're going through in Scripture. We shouldn't feel rubbed wrong by that. Rather, we should feel like, oh, man, I'm called to do this. And it's, it's not a burden to us. We're called to see the commandments of God as good. And we'll want to obey the Lord, finding joy, rather than feeling worn down. So again, we're called to care about our relationship to the Master. And we see in our parable in verse 26 through 28, the master responds. And I, I, love, I love the way Jesus tells this parable. Because notice, he actually uses the one talent man. I'll call him that from now on. The one talent man. He uses his own logic on him. Look here. He says, you knew where I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. When he says then... He's turning the tables around on him. He's like, hey, if you knew I had authority, if you knew that I had power and influence and I could reap, uh, um, I could reap finances or I could give blessing and pour it out on people, then why did you not trust me with what I gave you? Like, I, I, don't, I don't get what you're saying. You, you, you're saying I have a lot of authority and power and yet you don't trust me for that? Don't you think I could? The answer is yes. And as a result, this man's lack of faith, his talent's taken from him. And it's given to the one who did the most with what he had been given in this life. And that's a possibility. That's a possibility. What you've been given can be taken from you and given to someone else. That's why it's all opportunity. That's why we pray at the end of service, God, thank you for all the opportunities. They're all opportunities to bless God and multiply. Then we come across verse 29. Verse 29. It says, For to everyone who has, more will be given. He who has an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Does this sound familiar? Jesus says this elsewhere. To whom much is given, much is required. Or if you're watching any of the Spider-Man movies, 
With great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, they stole that from the Bible. What do you know? How a person cares for God, who's the master of all things, reveals the heart. When uh, I finished Bible college, soon after Molly and I got married, and I realized then that God was calling me to go to seminary. And so we packed up our stuff in Houston and went to Fort Worth. And I'd always heard, it's probably a good idea before you get married to finish your schooling. But here's what I found out. While being a master's student as a married man, I noticed something. Because of my love for my bride, I worked harder. I cared more for who God had given me. I cared more for the stuff I had. And in fact, the school even awarded me a scholarship because my grades were good. Now, mind you, I was a terrible student before all this. In high school, I had a 2.0. A 2.0. And I wanted to go to Texas (laughs) A&M. You hear what I'm saying? That wouldn't fly. But something changed when I got married. I wanted to take care of the one God had given me. I wanted to provide for my bride. And I also, I wanted to be a better servant in the life of the church. I wanted to dedicate myself to, to, to my studies in that season. You see, when the love of God is in us, we want to take care of what God has given us. We've got it wrong if we think we have to bring our best, our best skills, our best talents, our best abilities, and that by our effort and our trying and our doing more, that everything will be based on that. And we're missing the most important component to all of it. As Christians, You're not just supposed to work your hardest, though that's a good thing. But you are meant to put your trust in him so that as you work, as you parent, as you live your life, you're asking for God's help in all of it. You're asking him to multiply, him to do more than you could do on your own. You're saying to him, God, Bring the blessing you would have, but only your will be done. God, I'm seeking you, your kingdom, and your righteousness. And everything else we need will be added unto us. That's that's the direction of our faith. Now, I wish I could say this parable closed with a nice and neat bow, all pretty without the darkness and the reality of hell. But this is where verse 30 closes in our parable. As the master speaks to his third servant, he says, Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I don't always bring up the reality of hell, but it's something we ought not to gloss over. I think we as Christians can talk about hell in such a winsome way by how we speak with wisdom. Hell is real. Hell is something that God does not desire for anyone. And yet we see here, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth is a picture of hell. And you can cite this. There's some debate amongst theologians. Well, maybe this is not really hell. Maybe it's just a picture of, you know, punishment. Well, if you were to read Matthew 13, 41 through 42 you would see that Jesus is talking about throwing people into a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. You would see that in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, that there is a place where death and Hades, which is a waiting place for anyone who dies and is apart from Christ, death and Hades is opened up and they're cast into the lake of fire forever and ever more. Anyone whose name is not written in the book of life. But listen, God's heart is not that direction for you. That's not his heart for you. 
1 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is slow to fulfill his promises. As slow, some who, he's not slow to fulfill his promises, rather, as some who count slowness. But he's patient. He's patient towards you. He's waiting on you. And today, don't wait anymore. Don't, don't just say, I'm going to put that off till some other day. Even if you've gone to every Sunday school class, every Bible study, every church service, and you say you're a Christian, if you don't know for certain that you're in Christ, give your life to Jesus today. He's waiting patiently, desires that for you. Don't be like the third servant. Don't push it away. He wants you to care about the relationship to the master. Because through that relationship, you have salvation. That's why we're to care about that relationship to our master. I want to send her into a time of response. So would you stand with me at this time? The master here in the parable tells his two servants... Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And that's not just a kind statement from a parable. That's something he wants you to hear today. Something you can receive today. You can enter into that joy. You can enter into that celebration. You can have the joy of salvation today. He offers it freely. He offers it openly. But don't get stuck under this other mindset that if you're a good enough person, you can get into the kingdom of God. Because what's good enough? How many good works are you going to do? What's the, what's the equation there? You can't do enough. And then you still have your sin. And Jesus Christ came to pay it all. All of it. Paid in full. You can be justified by him, by his work on the cross. And here's what he offers today. Jesus offers his perfect life for you that you could not live. He offers his death in your place for your sins as a sacrifice. So you would have forgiveness of sin. So you would have perfect relationship with him. And then he didn't just die, but he rose victoriously from the grave. We don't worship a God who just died. We worship a risen Savior. And one day, one day, we'll all stand before him, believers and unbelievers. And we have to give an account of our life. As I've said before, Jesus died on the cross for you in your place. Wouldn't you rather him be judged for his perfect life than do you be judged for your imperfect? He offers that. So if you're joining us online, would you text the word Lakeland to the number at the bottom of the screen? And if you're here today, I invite you to respond. Maybe there's somebody God's put on your heart to pray for. Come up and pray with Ross and I. Maybe you today have played the church game long enough and you're like, okay, God, I hear you loud and clear. I want to give myself to you. You can come down front and talk to one of us. And we'd love to pray with you and talk to you about a relationship with Jesus. Would you bow with me?